you can open your Bible to Deuteronomy 34 tonight. If you need a copy of the notes, you raise up your hand and somebody will get those for you. Got everyone covered. Okay. Deuteronomy 34, we will start in verse 1 and we'll read through. Uh, Verse 9. I'll just read through the end of the chapter, the end of the book. Thirty-four, one of Deuteronomy. Here's what it says. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Nephtali, and all the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea. And the south, in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zorah. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed, and I have caused thee to see it with thy eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, was, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him as did as, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all of Israel. Let us pray together. Father, tonight as we come together, we gather around the grave of Moses. Tonight, Lord, we are in Moab, so to speak surrounding that grave, remembering the life of the greatest leader that Israel ever had. And Father, tonight we're going to gather some lessons from this man's life, just practical lessons for our lives. So Lord, I pray that you would uh, allow the Spirit of God to, Lord, to instruct us to take the lessons and apply them to our lives as he would see fit. Father, it's been a great study, and we thank you for it. Lord, uh, bless what we're going to look at tonight, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is, uh, in what I read tonight, there is so much, and we won't by any means cover all of it, but we'll get what we can tonight as we talk about a message entitled, Bur Buried in Moab. The death of Moses, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but one thing that I just kind of set your mind on a little bit, there's a huge contrast in uh, his death and the death of Christ. Let me give you something to think about. God buried Moses, and God raised Jesus from the dead. There's a reason for that. There's a picture in that, and I'll get you that as we go through our study tonight, and it's absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Let me start with the introduction, if I could. Tonight we have come to our final study on the life of Moses. In our study tonight, we're going to consider the death of Israel's great leader. Before we get into Deuteronomy 34, however, I want us to consider what events were taking place in the life of Moses before he died right up to when he died. So I've entitled this section right here, A Life of Service. Watch what I have. Moses was busy in his life right up to the day that he died. The last months of his life were full. He reviewed the law for the new generation of Israelites. He copied down the law in writing and gave it to the Levites. That would have been a 
a tremendous uh, work. That's in Deuteronomy 31, 24 through 26. It says this, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in, a, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for witness against thee. So that, was, that would have been a tremendous feat in itself. We go on. It says he spent time writing a new song given to him by God for the people. That's in Deuteronomy 31, 19. It says, Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put, in it, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. So he's copied. He has finished the writing of the law. He's finished the Pentateuch, so to speak. He has, he has wrote this song, but it goes on. Watch this. He then pronounced the tribal blessing upon Israel in Deuteronomy 33. I'm only going to show you the first verse, but it covers the entire chapter. And here's how the chapter starts out, 33.1. It says, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And then that continues, if you read chapter 33 of Deuteronomy, that continues right on through that chapter. So let me get you back to your paper. After these tasks were completed, it was time for Moses to die, and he was buried in Moab. So watch the application, because there is a, a, a really good application that we need to consider here. Watch this. What a way for a believer to finish their life. Moses finished his life by being busy for the Lord. He worked for the Lord right up until it was his time to die. Not everyone can do this, because not everyone has the health to actively serve the Lord until the end. But one of the problems today is that when some people retire from their secular work, they also retire from the Lord's work. They stop working altogether, even for the Lord. This is a great mistake because as long as the Lord allows us to live in this world, we should be serving Him. We may not be able to serve at the capacity that Moses did, and we may not be able to serve as we did when we were younger, but we must never stop serving while we are able. Let us die at the wheel. Let us die exercising our spiritual gifts if, if we are able. Let us be careful about getting unplugged from God's work and just coasting along while everyone else does the work. We are one body, and when one, when one member stops working, it affects the entire body. And that's so true, and that's, that happens a lot. And People retire and they, they'd say, well, you know what, I've did what I, I've, I've done all that I can do and so there's no sense, I'm not going to do anything else. And they retire from secular work and they retire from doing what God would have them to do also. And that's not the way God intends it. Right here's a prime example that right up until the day he dies, he works. He writes, he records the law. And if you've ever taken time to write something down, especially something like the Word of God, to get everything exactly right, and then he writes the song, and then he pronounces the blessing in, in Deuteronomy chapter 33. The man was busy the entire time, right up until the day that he died. And that's the way that we are to be for whatever we can do. Whether it, and it may just be praying for people. Then maybe that's what you can do. Because you get toward the end of your life. You know, I'll say this about my own self, that I'd like to be able to do what I'm doing right up till the end. But I don't know if that's what God will permit me to do. I don't know what the future holds, but I would love to be able to, I would love to go out serving God. I'll just say it that way. I'd rather, I'd rather die at the wheel then I would just sit back and say, well, you know what, I've, I've did everything, I'm not going to do anything else. Let somebody else do it and go lounge around in some place where, wherever it might be. I mean, that temptation is always there for all of us, but that's not the way that we are to be. We're to serve right up to the very end because we, even whenever we retire from our secular jobs, if, if that be the case, we're still members of the body of Christ and we still function together. So whenever one piece, it's like your foot. If your foot decides, well, guess what? I'm retired. I'm not going to work anymore. It's going to affect the, the, your entire body. If your hand doesn't work, it's going to affect your entire body and your lungs or whatever, so on and so forth. So the point is this. Moses had a life of service. When he stepped away from the palace, whenever we looked at that, and he started that journey, sure, he went away for 40 years, but that was whenever God worked on him. 
and molded and shaped him into the man that he wanted him to be before he met him at the burning bush. But from the time he stepped away from the palace, he was ready to serve. And he never stopped. He never stopped. He served right up to the end. Brings me to the next point. Viewing the land. Watch the next paragraph on your paper. We need to be reminded that when Israel was in Kadesh, they had no water and they complained against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron then went to the Lord and he instructed them to speak to the rock and God would bring forth water. We know the scene. We studied this. Moses, however, was angry with the people and he struck the rock for a second time, which proved to be very costly. Numbers 20, 10 through 12. Here's what it says. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear ye now, hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beasts. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I swear, which I have given them. Let me read the next paragraph. God told Moses and Aaron they would not be permitted to enter the land because of what happened at Kadesh. We talked about that. that Moses ruined an Old Testament type because the rock was the type of Christ. That rock was Christ, according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And so whenever the first time the rock was struck that was a picture of christ dying for us that was the suffering that he went through when he struck the rock the second time instead of striking it he was supposed to only speak to it because christ only had to die once for all not multiple times and so whenever he struck the rock the second time it ruined the old testament type and therefore it was extremely costly and god said to him You'll get them to the land, but you won't get them in the land. You will not go into the land of Canaan. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I swear, or which I have given them. Back to that paragraph again. Let me read all of it. God told Moses and Aaron they would not be permitted to enter into the land because of what happened at Kadesh. Moses later went to the Lord and requested permission to enter Canaan, but the Lord refused to allow it. Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 26, we see these verses. Moses says, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes. It would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice. Speak no more unto me of this matter. Hmm. Don't bring it up again, Moses. I've already pronounced the consequences for the sin of your anger and your unbelief. And so therefore, Moses, don't bring it up anymore. Watch 34 now. Deuteronomy 34. Watch 1 through 4. Here's the fulfillment. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the top, un, unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Nephtali, and all and, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the uttermost, utmost sea. In the south, in the plain of the valley of Jericho, in the city of the palm trees unto Zorah, and the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. You're here, Moses, but this is as close as it gets. You're not going to go over. That, it just Those verses, verses 1 through 3, to me, are amazing. I was reading uh, this past week about how that even where Moses stood, it was impossible to see all the land. But here we see that if you, if you pay attention to the wording, that he, whenever he got to the top of Pisgah, verse uh, 1, it says that it's over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead 
unto Dan and all Nephtali and all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah unto the utter, utmost sea in the south in the plain of the valley of Jericho in the city of the palm trees unto Zor. All the land. He showed it all to him. So he gave him some kind of supernatural ability to be able to, to see all the land. But he was not permitted to enter. Watch what I have on your paper. Moses was permitted to see the land, but he was not permitted to enter into the land. Here's the application. Let us learn that uh, it should say what Moses received here was second best. But second best is never an acceptable replacement for first best. So when temptation knocks at the door, let us remember that the cost of giving in is never compensated for by any rewards which you may gain in your sin. Did you catch that? Okay, so here's what I want you to understand. Temptation will come. Temptation will come, just as it did with Moses. But what you gain by giving in to the temptation, whatever it might be, whatever the situation might be, whatever you gain by giving in to the temptation will never, ever outweigh what you lose. That's the bottom line, what it costs you. It'll never outweigh that. The two can't even compare. Moses got second best. Climbed the mountain, he was able to see all the land, but he was not able to go into the land. So the sin cost him. That's what sin does. Sin carries with it consequences that oftentimes are irreversible. But you can't go back. You don't get a chance to do it over. You don't, you don't get a chance to reverse it. You don't get that chance. When the consequences come, they can last for the rest of a life. That's exactly what happened right here. Let me show you something because I want you to understand how to avoid this. If, if I could, I want to take a moment. I want to take you down a path here. Watch this. I want to take a moment and look at how sin happens in our lives. How does it happen? A lot of times Satan gets the blame. You know, you've heard the statement, the devil made me do it. No, listen, if you sin, it's because of you. If I sin, it's because of me. It's a choice. It is a choice. But <clears throat> to understand that a little bit more, James breaks it down. And James says something here and gives us some insight that I want you to understand. Watch this. James 1, 12 through 15. He writes this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God doesn't send the temptation. God's not going to tempt us to sin. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, now here comes the explanation. But every man is tempted, now watch this, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, that has the idea of a trap being baited to catch a prey. So every man is tempted whenever he sees the bait or whenever the bait appeals to him, whatever the bait might be, because that's what it is. It is a trap. Verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, okay, let me stop for a moment. So let's go back to verse 14 for a moment. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So there is something that comes into your life, whether it be a thought or whether it be something that you see or whatever it is, there is something that comes and it becomes a temptation. If you continue to, let me word it this way. If you continue to feed that temptation, you're done. You're done. You're not going to get away from it. You're not going to escape without what James talks about in verse 15. So there comes a time whenever we see the temptation and whenever that temptation is there and we recognize it and we know it and we got to flee from it, whatever it is. You know, if you're, if you're in a discussion and somebody says something that, that just gets on your last nerve and you know that one of your weaknesses is that, that you maybe you uh, at one time in your life or maybe even still 
you battle with anger. And so you can feel that in you. The, the thing that you need to do is get away from that situation. Because if you continue to feed that temptation, if you continue to stay there, there is a conception that takes place. Watch verse 15 now. Then when lust hath conceived, so there is a conception in the mind that takes place. Once there is a conception, this is true in the natural world, there's going to be a baby. If there is a conception, there's going to be a birth. Watch what James says. Let me read all the verse. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. There's the baby right there. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. But here's what James is saying. When you feed that temptation, and that's what happens. People feed the temptation. They don't flee from it. They continue to think on it. They continue to, to lust after it. And so once it goes so far, that conception takes place in the mind. And once that conception takes place, it's a, it's a sure thing that there's going to be sin committed. You're not going to get away from it. You're not going to back out of it. Watch with the paragraph. I think I kind of can I give you more detail there, but I'll give you a little bit of condensed picture here. Sin begins with a sinner being enticed with bait. It's at this moment we must recognize the temptation and flee from whatever it might be. When we do not flee, then what happens is there is a conception which takes place in our minds. And when there is a conception, there is going to be a baby, and the baby here is sin, and it will be carried out. Now, I'll show you that in action. You can, and not to criticize David, but you can see it in David's life. If you take what James writes and you carry it back to the Old Testament, to 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 4, I think you see that crystal clear. Let me show you that picture in this text. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. I think that contrast in that first verse with the word but tells you a lot. The kings, it was when the kings go forth to battle, but there was one king that wasn't in the battle, and that was David. He was idle, so to speak. Verse 2. And it came to pass at evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, roof he saw a woman washing herself. This is Bathsheba. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So right there, it should have ended. It should have ended right there. But it didn't. Because David continued to feed that temptation. He continued to, to lust after what he was able to see from his rooftop as he looked down on this young lady. And so watch how he feeds the temptation. Watch verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. So he's not dropped it. He's not allowed it to go away. But he continues to feed it. In other words, let's just find out who this woman is. It doesn't matter that it's wrong. He wants to know who it is. It goes on. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That right there should have put a flag up in his mind, and he should have said, no, I will have nothing to do with this. But he goes on, he feeds the temptation. David sent messengers and took her. She came in unto him, and he lay with her. She was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. It was carried out. In his mind, there was a conception. There was a literal conception, too. But in his mind, there was a, there was a conception that took place. And once it went that far, there was no reversing it. Watch what I have here. When, Dem when David saw the temptation, he should have fled the situation, but he did not. He continued to lust after Bathsheba, and he continued to feed the temptation. There was a conception in his mind, and the result was sin was born. The consequences of, for David were very costly and really run parallel with the cost Moses paid. Second Samuel 12, 7 and 8 says, whenever Nathan went to, to David to confront him about what he had done, 
about a year afterward, after the, the entire thing had came to pass. And, and not only had he uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba, but he'd also, he was also guilty of murder because he'd sent Uriah to the front lines to have him killed. Verse 7 says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee. Okay, so this is the, this is, it's now been exposed. David, you're the man. You're the man. He told the story about the, the man that killed the little sheep. And David said, you know, basically that man doesn't, shouldn't be able to survive. And Nathan says, you're the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, watch the end of this. This is sad. I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. You know what that is? That's lost potential. God says, David, I would have given you far more, but not now, not now. Or going back to Moses, Moses, I would have given you more. You could have entered the land. You could have led Israel into the land, but it's done. Moses, no, not now. Watch the next paragraph on your paper. One of the major costs for David was lost potential, and we could say the same for Moses. He could have led Israel into Canaan, but because of his sin, it would not happen. Instead, it would be Joshua. Moses missed out on great blessings. If this can happen to a leader such as Moses, it can surely happen to any believer like you and I. Let us never think light of sin, or we may experience many such judgments. What you gain by giving in to temptation doesn't even compare to what you lose by giving in to temptation. As Moses found out the hard way. Irreversible. Carried that the rest of his life. Watch the next one. The death of Moses. Watch 34, 5 through 7 now. It says this. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. That's a very interesting statement at the end of that verse. I'll come back to that. And he, God, buried him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Healthy as could be at 120 years old. But watch what I have here. There are several points concerning the death of Moses that we need to see. Number one is his condition. Watch verse 7 one more time. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, as I was not dim in his natural force, nor his natural force abated. Watch the top of page 5. Here we see that Moses was 120 years old, and his eyes were not dim, and his strength had never left him. Moses was a healthy and useful man. He climbed to the top of the mountain to see Canaan. So this tells us he was still in great shape. He was still able to work and accomplish things for the Lord. But it was his time to die. Don't miss that. Watch 34.5 again. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. That's the key. In other words, God said, Moses, this is the day. This is the time. It's time for you to die. It's time for you to die. This, Moses, you have reached the boundary. You've reached the boundary. You're not going beyond this day. It doesn't matter. Watch what I have on your paper. I, I put here uh, Job uh, 14, 1 and 2, and then verse 5. Job says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth as a shadow and continueth not. Verse 5. Seeing man, his days are determined. The number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. That's what Moses ran into, the boundary. He ran into the end. And that was the day. That was the appointed day. Watch what I have here. Moses had reached his limit on earthly days, and so he died. There was nothing anyone could do to stop his death. For it was all according to the word of the Lord. Even, listen, even with his strength still the way that it was whenever he was younger, his eyes were not dim. I could say this, he didn't need glasses. Moses was, was able to accomplish things. He worked right up to the end until the day that he died. 
And God said, it's time, Moses. It's over. Here's the application. The application here is very obvious. Our days are also numbered, and regardless of our health, when we reach our limit of earthly days, we will die. We will die. It doesn't matter about our health. It doesn't mean that we can't keep ourselves in halfway decent shape or whatever, whatever you got to do to just, you know, to, to at least do a little bit, not be caught up in, in, in uh, as some people get caught up in the whole exercise thing, thinking that, that you know, that it's all about uh, looking like we did whenever we were in our 20s. That's never going to happen again. I'll say that. No matter, there's not a gym around that can do that. Uh, but no matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter what kind of condition we are in, when that day comes, it's over. It's over. Watch this. We do not know when or how we shall die because God has not told us. And that is a real blessing. It's a real blessing. If you knew the day you were going to die, you would worry yourself to death before you got to that day to do everything you could to try to avoid it, and you wouldn't be able to avoid it. Watch this. Therefore, since we don't know, it is our responsibility to be ready to die. It's our responsibility to live in a way that if we died today, we would not be ashamed to stand before our Lord. That's what, that's what we're to do. Because we don't know when that day's coming. We don't know that. We don't know that, but just like Moses, you can be in really good health, and and the, all at once the day's here and it's over and it's done and you've reached the end of your earthly boundary and you can't go any further. We tend to think that you got to be sick or you got to be old to pass away, but that's not the case. And we think that you have to get to a point where you're not useful anymore. That's not the case. Sometimes God takes people that are still used, that you and I see as useful. And God says, you know what? Come on, it's time to go home. It's time to die. Or if it's an unsafe person, it's just time to die. It doesn't, listen, boundaries are set for people. So that was his condition. Let me show you uh, the grave of Moses. I can't literally show you the grave, but watch verse 6. And he buried him. That was God in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of the sepulcher unto this day. Secret. It was a secret place. Watch this. God was the one who buried Moses, and it was never revealed where Moses was buried. There was no tombstone or marker of any kind. The gravesite of Moses was a secret that was never revealed by God. So I raise a question. Why was the burial site of Moses kept a secret? Why was it? Why did nobody know? I think that you get some insight whenever we go to the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter, but Jude chapter 1 and verse 9, and here's what we read. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed, watch this, about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, let me just tell you what happened there a little bit, if I could, that there was a battle. There was a battle between Satan and Michael the archangel. Michael is, seems to be, if we read through the scriptures, he is the, the angel of the nation of Israel, so to speak. When we, if you go to, I believe it's Revelation chapter 12, and you see at the midpoint of the tribulation that, that Michael and his angels fight with Satan and his angels. And that tells you that as this the battles over Israel. And so here, because Satan goes to Michael, that tells me that this has something to do with the nation of Israel. And I personally believe this. I believe that Satan longed for the body of Moses. You say, Why? Because then he could have possessed his body, made it look like he rose from the dead. Israel would have then followed Moses, and he could have led him right into destruction. You say, why would he do that? Because from them would come the Messiah, the one that would destroy Satan eventually. Watch the paragraph. 
Satan came to Michael the archangel and Satan demanded to know where the body of Moses was buried. Why did Satan care? If he could have had access to the body of Moses, then he could have possessed the body and made it appear to be a resurrection and he could have led Israel into utter destruction. This was Satan's desire because he knew that from this nation would come the Messiah who would one day destroy him. So he had to be hidden. The body of Moses had to be hidden. The grave had to be a secret place and it could never be revealed because the people would have followed him. And if you think that's not the case, let me advance you to something that is yet future. Watch this. This is exactly what Satan will do with the Antichrist in the tribulation. Watch what he's going to do. Revelation 13, 1 through 4. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his, hor his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw, by the way, the beast is the Antichrist here. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Satan gives him his power, and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. What's that? I personally believe, and we talked about this coming through the book of Revelation, that in the tribulation period, the Antichrist will be killed. He will receive a deadly head wound. I'll tell you this. If, if you get a deadly head wound, chances are you're going to die. You know why? Because it's deadly. He gets a deadly head wound, but his deadly head wound is healed. What's that about? I believe it's about a resurrection. And that's when Satan enters into the Antichrist and makes it look like a resurrection. Remember, he's a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit, and so he is going to counterfeit what Jesus Christ has already done. And so he will counterfeit the resurrection. Watch the results of this. And all the world wondered after the beast. No wonder. No wonder if he had been dead and now he is resurrected. Watch this. Watch verse 4. Watch what they do. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, watch these statements, who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Of course, who can stand against the guy that can raise from the dead? Who can stand against the guy that has killed the two prophets that raise up in the beginning of the tribulation, and then God's two men, and then they die in the middle of the tribulation? If he can defeat them, and if he can raise from the dead then the world will certainly follow him. What would it have been like here if Satan would have got the body of Moses and made it look as though he was resurrected, caused him through the power of Satan, he would have led him down a path of utter destruction because he wanted to destroy the Messiah. He wanted this to destroy God's promise. But God hid Moses' sepulcher and no one knew. And Satan didn't know. And so he could not get to the body of Moses. But there's more here. Watch the next paragraph. There's yet something else very significant in bur Moses' burial. There's a great contrast between Jesus Christ and Moses. God buried Moses, but he raised Jesus from the dead. What's the importance in this? Watch this. Moses represented the law. Jesus represents grace and life. We are dead to the law. That's a picture here. God, because of his work, because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago, we are dead to the law. We, we're, we're, we're not under the law. We're dead to the, to the complete law. You understand that? Some people say, well, don't we, need the, don't we need the law to teach us God's moral absolutes? No. No, we don't. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that that is now taught by grace. We are taught by grace now, not by the moral law. Some people have a hard time with, with pastors that say that we are dead to the law. We're no longer, the, the law does not apply to us. 
And they say, well, you need that to, to understand God's moral absolutes. Well, let me ask you this question. Don't you think man knew God's moral absolutes before the law came about? Absolutely they did. Don't you think they knew it was wrong to murder and to steal and to commit adultery? Sure, they did. They knew that before. They didn't need the law for that. They didn't need the law, neither do we, because today we have grace that teaches you and I. But let me go back to this. So God buries Moses is a picture of the fact that the law, we are now dead to the law. But he raises Christ from the dead because in Christ we have grace and we have life. Watch 2 Corinthians 3, 6, if you would. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, the law killeth. The, I put the brackets there in mind. I want you to see that the law is a mass murderer. Because you and I, if, if somebody was going to live under the law, you're not gonna, you, don't, so you don't stand a chance. Because James chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that if we break one part of the law, we're guilty of breaking the entire law. So you don't want to live under the law because the law is a mass murderer. It'll, it, it, it demands our death. So in Christ, we are dead to the law. Watch Galatians 2, 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. So the significance is this. God buries Moses. He raises Christ from the dead. And that's a picture of how I am dead to the law, but I am alive in Christ. Jesus did what the law could not do. The law was never given to give life to anybody. It was given to show man his sin and how wicked and corrupt and depraved he really is. We're dead to the law now in Christ. In Christ, we have grace and we have life. Let me go to the last point, number three, the mourning over Moses. There's so much more we could talk about here, but we're going to limit it. 34, eight, and the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. 30 days, that's it. Time to move on. It goes on in verse 9. Joshua the son of Nun, and it'll go on and talk about Joshua. And then you go to the book of Joshua, and there's an announcement that God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now it's time for you to rise. It's time for you to lead the nation of Israel. But let me get back to this. Two points that we need to see here. Number one is the regret, if you would. It was not until Moses died that the people began to realize how important he was to them. That's sad. You know, they complained against Moses. They blamed him through the wilderness. And then that generation died off. And it wasn't long. This, the next generation was no different than they were. Watch the application. How often it is that we do not appreciate our blessings until we lose them. Let us learn to appreciate what we have while we have it. Notice the words of F.B. Meyer. And I quote, we often underrate the living and have to wait until they are removed from us to estimate them truly, unquote. That's sad, but that's a lot of times that's the way it is. It's not until somebody's gone that we actually understand how significant they were, how much they had to offer, how much they had to contribute. So I'd say that to say this, that if there's somebody in your life that you've never really went to them and you've never said, you know what, I appreciate the wisdom you have or I appreciate what you've done or just to say I love you. I suggest you do it because after they're gone, it's too late. Let me get you one more point. The restraint on dealing with the mourning. Watch this. Israel mourned 30 days and then it ended. This was a good thing. Because mourning is not to go on indefinitely. It's not. The application, the period of mourning is proper. But it must cease after a period of time. Too much mourning demonstrates a lack of faith in God. There comes a time when you got to pick yourself up and you got to go on. As hard as that is at times, too much mourning is a lack of faith. That's the bottom line. And it's not healthy. And so we're, uh, we're all going to lose people in our lives. There's people that are going to die. One of the, you know, one of the hardest things 
when, when, I, when God called me to be a pastor, there were things that I never thought about. But I've come to know over the years that one of the most difficult parts of being a pastor is bearing your friends. That's hard. And it comes, unless God decides that, that it's me that goes. But that's one of the most difficult things because you learn to rely on people. You learn to rely on people, and so they become pillars, and so you lean on them, and then they go. And there's a period of mourning, but then you get up and you go on, because just like here, there was a Joshua to step into the void. And so Israel was to go on. That's the way it is in our lives. We continue to serve like Moses as long as we possibly can. We serve God. Here's the conclusion. Watch this. Moses was a man who accomplished much for God. The key to his accomplishments was his fellowship with God. He knew God. That's, the, that's one of the major keys. Watch, uh, watch let, let me read for you. Watch verse 10 of Deuteronomy 34. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face and all the signs and the wonders which the Lord had sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land hmm. the, just that fellowship just that, that closeness with God watch what I have here the closer the fellowship the greater the accomplishments doubt in service vanishes the closer we walk with our Lord for the better we know him, the greater our faith. That's where Moses was at. He knew God. He was close, face to face. And so the, this man had tremendous faith. Tremendous faith. That's why it says there wasn't a prophet like him since in Israel. In that last line, let us be determined to walk close by the side of our Lord and be determined to learn more and more about him. Because that's what strengthens our faith. So don't listen. As we go through life, uh, there's so many opportunities to be with God and to, to spend time to get to know Him. The problem is this, that in our world, there are so many distractions. And there are things that will pull you off to the side and pull you away. And, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. There's nothing wrong with hobbies. There's nothing wrong with with vacations and doing things of that sort. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's good for us. The Lord says, occupy till I come. But at the same time, we need to learn a balance. And there needs to be a drawing near to God, to know Him better. So that as time goes on and difficulties arise, that we will trust him. And I can assure you, as we've talked about before, there will be difficulties. There will be. That brings me to this closing and going to next week. Next week's First Peter. In the background for First Peter next week, get a foundation laid as we go into the book as he writes to a group of believers that have been scattered because of persecution. I think that's a great study for us based upon the direction that our world is going. Let us pray. Father, Father, we thank you for the study of the life of Moses. Lord, we didn't exhaust it by any means. We didn't. But, Father, we gathered a lot of lessons as we went through his life and even through his death here tonight. Father, we thank you for what we have learned. Father, we thank you for that. As I ended tonight, I talked about just the accomplishments of this man. And those great accomplishments were there because he knew you. He walked with you. He knew you face to face. So therefore, his faith was great whenever he faced the trials. Father, we have that opportunity to draw ever so close to you so that we too would have that faith to face the trials that we're going to face in the future. So, Lord, put within us a longing to know you, to know your word, a desire to draw closer to you. Lord, put within us a hollow 
that only you can fill. Help us to seek you to fill that hollow within us. Father, again, we thank you for the study. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.